Well, it is no small thing to lead the final panel of such a stimulating discussion today, especially one on faith race in the 2020 election. Eh, not, no, no big deal. Just a, it's a light little conversation. I don't know about you, but I sort of feel like we are collectively, as a nation, on a roller coaster. And we're at that point on the roller coaster when you're in the car and you're going up the hill. And you know the way a roller coaster works is you get to the top of the hill and then you stop. And then you go down. And I feel like we're just climbing the hill and soon we will be going down that hill and around the loops and everything that we can expect to experience here in the next year as we brace ourselves for what will no doubt be an exciting presidential election year. It's my pleasure to uh, lead our conversation today with three uh, faith leaders. You've heard their introductions. You've heard a little bit of their stories. We'll hear more about them uh, through the course of the next few minutes. And what we'd like to do today in this panel is build on what we've heard already today about what faith groups can do in civic life and in political action but now direct our attention to the future. What can we expect to see here in the coming year and maybe even beyond? So I'd like to start by asking um, each of our three panelists just to reflect for a few moments on what they plan to do to lead their congregation during this election year? Are there particular themes you will emphasize or particular things you will do? Are there lessons you've learned from the past that you anticipate employing here in this election year? Why don't we start with Reverend Tyler? of what then uh, was known as segregated pews, where black worshipers uh, entered into what was then the Methodist Church in the 1780s as welcome uh, partners in ministry and in worship. And as the country wrestled with the question in the 1780s as to what to do with black folk, um, and the country made the decision to um, basically turn its back this newly, uh, you know, hard fought freedom turned its back upon uh, black people in the country, the church has followed suit. And so segregation within the Methodist church was not its original state. And they introduced segregated pews and pushed black worshipers to the back, and then built balconies to put black worshipers in. And our founder, Bishop Richard Allen, walked out of St. George's Methodist Church in 1787 and founded the AME Church, and others followed suit in other places. And since that time, uh, it seems that we've been fighting the same battle. Uh, as I say to the members of my congregation and those who I work with in Philadelphia, that each generation has to find its own fight. So 2020's election uh, looks very much like many of the elections that our ancestors have also fought. Uh, I was not surprised by the election of Donald Trump. I think many people took that election for granted. But if you think about it historically, every time black people make a, move, a major move forward, it is met by a Trump-like experience. The ending of slavery, first Reconstruction, but at the end, it's then followed by Jim Crow. The end of the Civil Rights Movement was followed by things like tracking in public schools uh, that took away the right, I think I need another mic, um, that, that took away uh, the right of having a truly integrated experience. So Barack Obama most naturally had to be followed by a Donald Trump. The question in 2020 then is, will we sleep like we did in 2016 or will we do something different? And so my mantra is, uh, don't take anything for granted. Take your uncles, your aunts, your cousins, uh, your boo, everybody you can to the polling <laughs> place in 2020 so that we don't have a repeat. <laughs> Rabbi? 
Yes, so I think for us in the Jewish community, we're facing some of these things, again, that nothing is new and everything is new. And uh, oh. since 2015, in the United States, anti-Semitic attacks are up by 90%. And that just this year, the FBI has reported that the religious motivated anti-Semitic crimes that are happening in New York, 60% of them are against Jewish people. Oh. And so, what are we doing right now, both as our own faith community and how does that reflect the larger existence in the American politic? And I think a lot about what happened after the Tree of Life shooting, that um, there's a beautiful thing that happened here in Cincinnati, that it happened on a Saturday during the Sabbath where the Jewish community doesn't usually access electronics or they're walking to and from the synagogue and the police in Amber the Village knew the Jewish community so well that they walked to their synagogue, they waited them for, for them to leave, and then walked them home to make them feel safe. That is an example of how police and community can know each other. And I was really heartened by that, and I also thought of how many communities are not greeted with that kind of thing, that they aren't connected to police like that, and yet um, that the police are actually a source of fear and threat rather than safety. And so I think that the unique call from our Jewish community right now, and my congregation specifically, is how do you extend the safety that you're having even as a minority culture, even as you're being targeted, and um, make that the small strength that you do have into a broader allyship. I think that one of the ways that we were successful in some of the other political events that we've been doing is that we didn't think we could do it alone. And we built that power slowly with other faith communities and other people who, um, are not just being victimized, but actually have strengths that they can be offering and teaming with those. So our community will be focusing also in Get Out the Vote, um, specifically in poverty in our community and, and thinking about what we can bridge here in our city. Thank you. Imam. So um, for our Muslim community, we have been experiencing uh, Islamophobes since 9-11, when uh, war on terror started, That's, that was for us was like a war on drugs for the black America, American communities. So what happened was in our community, we kept hiding and hiding and hiding more, thinking that it will go away, and making sure that some of us, especially those who get affected the most, was the most vulnerable ones, the youth and the faith leaders who got targeted in the airports, and the youth became like you know vulnerable because of all this we, we, we always talk about what was going on back home and also what's going on here, so that affected them a lot. So in Minnesota, the mosque I was, uh, I'm an imam of and I lead, 2017, from 2011 to 2017, there was a neighbor of us who was putting together a blog that reporting about us and what we do and how many times we pray and what we, you know, uh, how many park, how many, how, how many times we overfill the parking lot and that, attracted the white nationalists of white supremacists around the nation and we got attacked and we bombed 2017 where I was the next room when the bomb was landing in the room next to me. So cool. before, prior to that, we tried to hide, even one time remove the sign of the mosque. So maybe we said this uh, Islamophobia, you know, attacks and the harassment will stop. And when we were bombed and was, as we were hiding, that was not the solution. So we started trying to connect with faith communities. And yes, when we, were, when we were attacked, a lot of faith leaders came to us. But after the event you know, ended, then nothing else happened. So at, the, at that moment, I, we decided, we said we have to do something about it. And we connected with a group called Isaiah. We got trained. And that training taught us, or showed me at least, you know, how we can organize our community and connect with other communities and change our situation. Not necessarily always building relationship will change unless there is an organizing behind it and there is an agenda and actually getting power. If the community is powerless, then there is nothing getting, getting changed. So after the attack 2017, then the neighbors who were kind of uh, putting this block together, they double down. They start saying they were the ones who were putting the, it was a hoax. It was, even from the Washington, when someone, a news reporter asked them, what, what would you say about the mosque was attacked and bombed? He said, the Washington guy said, it was, this is a hoax. This is a lefty thing and it's not a real thing. And hearing that from the uh, 
the highest office on the, in the country and also seen from the neighbor who is making us very dangerous people who live in the neighborhood, that did not give us a chance to just stay silent. So we reached the community around us. We tried to organize, but we did not know how. And that's how uh, we, we, we created a Muslim coalition of Isaiah. We became part of Isaiah in 2018 to, for the first time. Muslims, we came together in the U.S. Bank Stadium, Viking Stadium, and we prayed where everybody was saying that if you go there, you will be killed. If you don't do this, I mean, the right wing just trying to organize, and just for the security, we paid $80,000 just to protect the 45,000 Muslims who are coming just to pray for two hours. So, but that opened and gave us a hope that we can change our situation. We can connect with other people. We can actually build a power. And through that, 2018, the election followed. We actually uh, flipped the state representative, uh, state house from those who were kind of scapegoating us to those who were working with us and kind of understanding our situation. And what we are encouraging to faith leaders, don't be bystanders. Because if you also, I mean, if you build a relationship, it's good. But building relationship only, it's not going to help unless we put action, a strategy and action, and build power that can change those who are vulnerable and those who are weak among our communities. And that's what we did in 2018. And we are planning to uh, 2020 to have 2,500 2, Muslim delegates to caucus and to be part of the system and change big time. And that's how we are also, our allies are working with us and we became in our state very effective, and a lot of Muslim youth and a lot of Muslim women are joining us, and this you know, gave them a hope that we can be part of the system. Also, we can change the system if it's not working for us. And that's what we did, and that's what we're trying to do. Thank you. Uh, I know I, yeah, that's. <clears throat> I know I speak for uh, everyone in the audience in thanking each of you for sharing your stories as a reminder that uh, sometimes in my business as a professor of political science, we begin to talk about politics in a very abstract way, but this is a reminder of what we mean when we talk about the stakes of an election, the stakes of what happens in our civic sphere. They matter, They're, the stakes are high. And so I'd like to actually pick up on a theme, um, Reverend Tyler, that you mentioned how you like to preach to your congregants that they should not take this election for granted. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, when you deliver a message like that, and I'll just ask this of, of everyone on the panel, do you find that there are challenges that you face in, in mobilizing people and convincing them to get involved? Or are, are, are people willing to enter the fray or do they prefer to stay on the sidelines? Well, so, so my context is a little different. Um, as an AME, um, and you know, all black churches are not the same, we're not a monolith, and so there are certainly conservative black churches that believe that um, the church is only to you know, talk about things that are in heaven to come. And then there are churches like ours that, um, you know, James Clyburn, uh, Congressman Clyburn is a very active member of the AME church. So for us, politics is the way in which we live out our faith. Right. I mean, that's that's who controls purse strings and budgets and school districts and police departments and everything else that impacts us. So we certainly believe that we not only have a right to be there, but there is a call to be in that space. And I think it has become much more vivid in the last five years. I'm, I'm just kind of struck by the fact as I sit here with um, two colleagues I've never met before today. Um, but I work very closely with the group in Philadelphia Power. Philadelphians organized to witness, empower, and rebuild, which is a sister organization to Amos in uh, Cincinnati and uh, Isaiah in Minnesota. And I'm thinking that there were three distinct incidents that happened in the last five years that drew our communities much closer. Uh, first was the uh, murders of nine persons at uh, Mother Emanuel, which is um, one of our congregations, the Amy Church. I knew Reverend Pinckney very well. Uh, we were friends. And when we hosted at our church a prayer vigil that next night, um, the pulpit was filled with clergy, the church was overflowing, and uh, one of the imams from uh, the masjid in Philadelphia, rabbi friends, were all in the pulpit with me. And I made the statement that, you know, folk were here and they're not even AME. And um, my imam uh, friend said, no, Reverend Tyler, tonight we're all AME. Mm. 
Um, after the election of the president in 2016 and the Muslim ban happened, in Philadelphia, as planes were landing from some of those countries and people could not get off of the plane, um, the community poured out and we flooded the airport. I mean, just thousands of people. It was just incredible. It was no, nobody organized it, but thousands of people. We were there with our Muslim brothers and sisters saying that if you can't get off the plane, we can't get off the plane. And then after the Tree of Life, I found myself offering condolences and consolation to my Jewish brothers and sisters at Congregation Road of Shalom in the pulpit with them. And so we've been drawn together in this um, period of, I won't say it's unprecedented hate, but it's unprecedented for many people in this generation who have never, people like my children who told me years ago that I'm making things up, the world's not like that, what are you talking about? who are now themselves becoming activists because of it. So our, the scales have fallen off. And so I think that it is said to us with events like that, that we don't have a choice to sit on the sideline. That we cannot, I mean, we, we've, we've witnessed what the result of doing nothing is. And so we may not be successful, you know, in changing the landscape this time, but certainly you have to do something. Wow, thank you. Are there, I, I, I'm curious, are there other perspectives, other thoughts on whether any of your congregants are a little reluctant to get involved in politics? Is that something you have to deal with? Um, yes, I mean, especially as an immigrant community from East Africa where the government was not nice to us back home, mm. getting involved into a politics people perceive as something that not safe or not righteous. I mean, many different perspectives, but when, as an imam, when I, when I was relating to my community, I would simply bring stories of the prophets in the Quran. For example, I mean, stories of Moses, when he had to change the situation of, I mean, it's in the Quran, almost narrated by many, more than, I think, 50 times. I mean, how he organized children of Israel and how he led them. And then that was something that we have to learn from the Quran. And, that the challenge is always the, the fear of unknown. And there is also the cultural differences. And yet there is this huge thing that we don't even know how to put words in, what's going, what's happening to us. So yes, the challenge is coming from different places, but the, the, the reality is when, 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 especially when we got bombed, I was telling my community, what else are we waiting for? I mean, are we waiting for people to come to kill us? And how can we not change our situation and not, you know, kind of organize ourselves? I mean, it was hard for us the first time because joining Isaiah was the question, are we joining a church or what is going on? Who is Isaiah? <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it's like becoming a member of a, a mosque, is becoming a member of a church. No, Isaiah is not a church. I mean, actually, we had to go and do a research. Isaiah is one of the prophets that mentioned in our Quran, in our you know, tradition. And it was kind of very tough and challenging that how can we, I mean, how can a people of faith work together and, and, and try to seek things that can benefit all of us, not one of, some of us. So, yes, the challenge was huge and immense, but... The, the need was there and also we were, um, as the leaders, we were not, you know, kind of asking permission. We were leading and, and, and trying to take a risk and that's how. Sure. We, we um, Rabbi, we'll get to you in just a moment, but could you, um, Mohammed, maybe just fill us in uh, so we're all on the same page and just what exactly Isaiah is, not the biblical prophet, I, presumably people can, you can Google him, but uh, when you refer to Isaiah, this is an initiative yes. in Minnesota. Isaiah is an, organizing organization that uh, predominantly used to organize only churches, but after, I think, 2017, when we got involved, we kind of propositioned and, and talked and asked them that if we can, as a 30 of mosques, can join them and become member of this organization, they organize institutions to kind of uh, racial justice, fight for racial, racial justice, and uh, um, uh, mostly that organize people who are like immigration or mass incarceration or, you know, uh, um, I would say uh, health care and many things they work on, but Muslims and especially the Muslim community, East African predominantly, we did not even know what power organization means. So, or Isaiah, when we sat down with them, they were doing these things that we 
all affects us. And we said, okay, let's sit down with them and ask them how can we work together. So then after 2017, we, as I think, uh, alongside our mosque, alongside 30 other mosques, joined them and became members. And what we do is we get trained and we, we train leaders and we work on, we kind of put together an agenda. We have strategy sessions that community come together and find the, like what is what our common is and also strategizing a path that we can all work together and what, how can we hold politici politicians accountable and also how can we go public rather than you know, staying private. Thank you. Now, Rabbi Miriam, I know you've had uh, some experience in this area with organizing, and I, again, I'm just curious of this theme of whether you found it ever a challenge to convince others to get involved in politics, or oh, yeah. is that a natural Every day. thing for yeah. people to do? <laughs> I don't think any part of any organizing work is easy, and part of it is making sure, like Elizabeth said earlier about holding the story at the heart of all things. And I laughed so hard when you said, are we joining a church? Because it certainly feels like that, that um, it feels often like the Christian body is sort of holding this organizing network and that the peripheral relationships or the peripheral faith organizations are sort of entering into it. Luckily, in our state, we have an amazing organizing collaborative that is also Jewish that can work sort of in between these things. So I think there is just the natural thing, like we're comfortably being friends with other faiths, uh, knowing your neighbor, but building power with your neighbor requires a level of honesty and inward expression and and um, just honesty and, and change that's really hard to come by. I also think um, we live here in, which hopefully is still a swing state, um, where, <laughs> you know, but be, beyond it being many different political views in your synagogue and also, or like, is it for God or is it for politics and getting those things, but it isn't easy to change anything. And so looking for the opportunity and then the power building that goes with it and then the hard work there, I think it's really hard to do. And I also think that a lot of justice work is about failure. So I'd say like 90% of the time you're, you're failing mm -hmm. and um, it doesn't happen and it's really hard to see the long view. And so I think the hardest part about getting people in it is less that they're complaining that it's different, but more, am I gonna make any difference? It's not gonna change anything and staying awake to the fact that you have no idea what your impact is in the moment and that it's worth doing anyways. Thank you. Now, in my world, again, as a professor of political science who's interested in religion, most of the time, if, for example, I'm called by a reporter or if I'm talking with a student, the emphasis is always on the way religion can divide Americans. That when religion gets mixed up with politics, it just serves to pull Americans apart. And I have found actually in my own scholarship, while certainly religion can be a source of division and we've seen that in recent years, there is another narrative that religion can also serve to unite people. It can unite people within a faith tradition, but it can also unite people across faith traditions. And that can even include people who are themselves not religious, who may have turned their back on religion or don't think of themselves as a person of faith, but they can often nonetheless find connections with people who are themselves religious because they can find common cause on an issue or whatnot. So what I would like to have our panelists reflect on for a moment is whether you find reason for hope for the role of faith and religion in American politics. Um, can I just? Please. Okay. So I have a little, I mean, I'll share with you a story of what happened to us the day that we were bombed. And it was Saturday morning. I mean, it's very interesting for me when I reflect back how faith leaders can change the narrative, even the media, not the, you know, the, the system, not only the government system or the politics. So that morning, I remember it was 5 a.m. when the bomb landed through, through the window. And... The firefighters came, they did not know what happened. They said, this is, there is something very terrible happened in this room. We don't know, this was the imam's room. This was the most sacred room in the mosque, I mean, beside where we pray. So they said, we'll call the police and call also the FBI. And I did not know how to translate that at that moment, why the FBI is coming. And you know, this is the Muslim community. When you hear FBI, what follows is like, who is the terrorist? And what we know from the past, it was only Muslims who were assigned to be a terrorist. So 
what, we, what I did was I asked what happened and I was kind of trying to figure it out. The, the police came and they said, there is something exploded in the mosque, something exploded in the So the immediately media picked up that line and said, something exploded in the mosque. And the first press release was something happened in the mosque and we don't know and it looks like a bomb. And all those who were not nice to us, they start saying, oh, they were planning to do something. And they, they, I mean, it was so bad wow. that we did not, I mean, uh, it, was, it was so hard. People who were with me, they ran away. Those Muslims who were kind of, those who were prayed with me that morning, they said, Mohammed, we'll come back, just figure it out. We don't know what's going on. And it became like, who came, who put something, and all this. And two hours later, one of my friends called all the rabbis and priests, and I mean, all the faith leaders came, like two hours later, to, in our support. And we hold a big conference, you know, a press conference in front of the mosque, and they said someone attacked the, mass, the mosque, and this is not acceptable. That's what they said. They didn't know, they did not wait anybody. They just said, we are not accepting. This is what's happening to our mosque. It, if it happened to our mosque, it, it also happened to our church, and it's happened to our synagogue. That was a Saturday morning. Even rabbis, they, I mean, they, they showed up. And that immediately changed the narrative of the media. And they immediately said someone attacked the mass. That's that was as simple as when they showed up, when people of faith shows up, when you are in in in, in the high in, in in the most difficult time, they can change the narrative. They can change people's how, how people think. And I would say yes, they have a big role. I mean, faith can save humanity if they were, I mean, if we focus on love, compassion, and if we see each other as a, as a human being, we can, yes, we can stand next to each other and, and, and say this is not what we accept. But if most of us are silent and we are, I mean, I ask more, many times, I even reach out those who are not nice to us, and I said, do you guys go to, to a church? Or can, yeah, can I talk to church leader? That those who are not nice to us, I ask them, can I talk to you, your faith leader, so I understand what did we do, so uh, what can we do so we can change our, your situation and the way you see us? And I finally we did, and this is what happened in our state. And I mean, thank God that we, the impact we we have seen for the last two years made us uh, hopeful in our state that we can have again a state that can love each other and people can coexist each other without harming each other. And also, not only being prote I mean uh, defending ourselves, but also sharing the resources we have. There is much that we are all can, can have that our state, and that's what we are our, as, as an or Isaiah organizing, and yes, yes, that uh, people of faith can change the situation, especially can impact the 2020 election, and this is what I'm calling all of you, you know, get up and do something about it, and be especially organizing. You can relate with many of us, and we can show up, but we have to work, we have to put action, and strategy, and also get power so we can change our situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That is an incredible story. Are there other thoughts from other panelists on, on hope? Is there any hope? <laughs> <laughs> well, I th <clears throat> yes. I think, so. I think that one of the pervasive issues in our world right now is just intense loneliness and this feeling like you can't make a difference and that one of the gifts that faith offers us is to remind us that even when we feel lonely, we are not alone and that the way we can express that faith can happen in the streets, can happen protesting, certainly happens organizing and building power, and that when hope does fail us or when loneliness does come for us, that we can return back to that community and that faith to buoy us during that moment. And, and I think in that spirit, to think about those of us whose faith point is justice, and that I think that maybe it's not new, but maybe it's an emergent acceptance that a way to be living out your faith is to be living out that justice, and those are intertwined. So, yeah, I, I think there's a lot to be hopeful for right now. Yeah, yeah. So, um, is there hope? Um, my answer really depends on what day you ask me. Um, <laughs> some days I'm more hopeful than others. Um, you know, I think that it begins really with us as individuals, right? Uh, there's a um, this tendency of human beings to um, always want to exclude. And so if you don't think exactly like I think, then there's something wrong with you. 
and uh, each of us belong to probably a different, you know, strand of our own religious traditions. You know, the United Methodist Church, one of our sister denominations, is about to split uh, again. Uh, they split in 1844 over slavery. Now they're splitting over, um, you know, the issue of queer rights. And every time they get together, it's kind of like that song, make up to break up, that's all we do. <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> so within our own traditions, we cannot find unity, right? So what, what we have found in our organizing work is not to focus on what makes us different, but what unites us. So doesn't matter if your child is, you know, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Baha'i, Quaker, or, you know, atheist. If you go to a Philadelphia school, they're going to probably have water that they can't drink because it's contaminated. They're going to probably have lead and asbestos in their buildings. Um, you know, our city has the highest poverty rate of any large city in America, the Big Ten, 26% poverty rate, 13% of those folks living in what we call deep poverty. So when we start thinking about the things that unite us, when we focus on those things and leave the things that separate us, you know, kind of like that's your own. When you go back and worship, you can worship however you choose to or not. Um, but there's so much more in our, in our sacred text that speak to the commonality. I'm listening to a Muslim talk about Moses, right? And, you know, as a Christian, that, I, we call him the first, like, social justice activist, right? Um, first union organizer, if you will. So I think that, um, <laughs> so, so for me, I really do think that, that we have to um, find it within ourselves to back away from what is natural. And that is, again, to separate and to draw distinctions and instead do what is, you know, countercultural and focus on that which brings us together. And thankfully, um, if nothing else, Donald Trump is a great uniter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's huge. He's a huge. Oh, yeah. He brought us all together. <laughs> and I'm sorry, by the way, uh, my church is a 501c3, so these are my views outside of my pulpit. Of course. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, a reminder, momentarily we will uh, take questions from the audience, so a re reminder that you can uh, submit questions as, uh, as we've been doing all day. Um, but just b before we get to that, I just was curious whether uh, the folks on the panel here have any, any advice that you would give either other, other faith leaders who would like to see their congregants more engaged in politics, recognizing the constraints that tax exemption does place on you? Or even if it's not for a faith leader, just sort of someone in the rank and file who feels like they want to be more involved and they want to try to get their neighbors and friends and family more involved. Do you have advice on how to do that? So I think it's about building power in any of those kinds of places that if your clergy member isn't moving, then build a small team and start moving them with that same thing. Take the meetings, engage in what they care about, motivate those things. Um, I know that after the Muslim land started for us too, that sanctuary work became really important in our city. And it was sort of, uh -huh. it was next to the issue 44 and like there was all these different things going on in our city, but it, it felt pressing. And um, there, eventually they landed up picking up a woman named Maribel Diaz who shouldn't have been picked up for all, all the reasons that we can imagine. And um, we mobilized really quickly as a faith community and suddenly found out lots of us cared about this thing. And even though we didn't have the infrastructure to organize around her, somehow we had protests at the jail. We had both of our senators and our governor agreeing that she shouldn't be deported. Um, eventually, we're in the New York Times, Rachel Maddow, so, like everything's going right. And um, we thought, we've got it, we've got it. And we didn't have it. She's deported anyways. And um, there was a huge moment of grief, at least personally, I, I felt that way, that I was supposed to be build power and we didn't even know how much we really cared about it and we did it anyways and it should have worked. And when it didn't, that didn't mean that our work stopped and we went on to build that sanctuary collection. And actually we have people in sanctuary now in the city that were collectively housing with that group of people who started. And a year and a half later, Mary Bell did return to Cincinnati and the government agreed that they had been wrong to deport her in the first place. But uh, that day when she, I know, it's amazing. 
But the day of deportation, I couldn't have known that we were part of this really long vision of what could happen. So one is keep your own faith to build power teams that are small and um, to not assume that you don't have allies out there that can join in that pursuit with you. So, so since you're talking about the sanctuary uh, movement especially, um, let me just add in that I think it's important to draw upon your own stories. Um, very often when we see things in the news or happen in our community, we don't feel that that's our story. So one of the big challenges in organizing in African-American churches has been, why should we care about folk who are being turned away at the border? Because, you know, many folk buy into the narrative, they're coming to take your jobs, right? So you mean the jobs your teenagers won't take, okay. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, so I'm, I'll be joining a conversation with Faith in Action um, in New Mexico soon around immigration and how can we strategize on, you know, making this a, a bigger issue for other people. And one of the things I've been saying is that in the black church, you know, historical tradition, family separation has always been our issue, right? Started um, on, you know, on the shores of Africa when families were separated and torn away, um, torn away at auction blocks, torn away in families whenever an owner lost, a, you know, a bet out playing poker, just pull somebody's child and settle your debt. Um, and so in our church history, we have a, pro, a project that's called Last Seen. Um, we have a large repository of the AME Church uh, newspaper, which started in the 1840s, 1850s. And from 1865 to like the 1920s, maybe that was like the last ad, that after the Civil War, uh, African-American members of the AME Church were taking out ads in our Christian Recorder newspaper. Uh, you can find this project, it was done by Villanova University in conjunction with us, last scene. And people were taking out ads all those years after slavery officially ended, trying to find family members. You know, here we are in the Underground Railroad Museum, right across from the Ohio River as people crossed into freedom. And so the ad would say, uh, last, you know, family member last seen in Georgia, last seen in Kentucky, this is what they look like. They belong to Master Smith, you know, in wherever, Covington or whatever. And so to say to, to African Americans that even if you don't think this is your issue, that in 30 years from now, we'll be seeing these same kind of ads done by children from Guatemala, from Honduras, from Mexico, from South American countries trying to find the people that they were separated from. So I think what I would challenge you is that there's not one group of people in this room, not even white men, who don't have some story of being persecuted and having some kind of trauma that you have gone through. So sometimes you have to take people back into their own pain to make a connection into the present and to show them that even if you don't understand them, you know what it is to go through this as well. So use your own story as much as possible. Thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So I just want to add, uh, this is very interesting. Uh, for me, uh, when I first attended the first training of week-long training of Isaiah, I, as an imam and as somebody who thought I was the most you know, I had the most pain around, you know, among the group. Mm. I found in that training, like uh, white folks who came from different places, and I'm like, I was asking myself, why are they here? I mean, what is their problem? I mean, what is exactly that? <laughs> I mean, I was bummed, so, and I don't know what else I could say. And talking to them, and kind of what, I, what one of the trainings was, uh, you know, uh, turning your, per, you know, personal pain into a public life and connect with people around you, have one-on-one -on -one and see what is their pain and how can we connect. And that was very amazing tool. When I sat down with one of my uh, friend who was white and I asked him, what's your problem? And I think she said, uh, my dad died because of no health care, because of the lack of this system of uh, privatizing uh, our health and our, I, I mean, I, I did not realize this, the pain, every one of us has a, had a pain that they can connect with other, with, with other person. I mean, that was the, the time that I realized if we just talk to each other and relate with each other and see how much one, once some of us suffer 
all of us will suffer because this will spread and will go and we are one body. I mean, if we don't take care of the b part of the body, then the infection will go everywhere. So today is me or is some of us, tomorrow it will be you. So as you just said, that uh, in the 1800 or so, like that's the time that family separation was the most painful thing. But now, 2019, we have kids in the cages. I mean, I, mean I, I cannot imagine this same experience is coming back in a different form or shape. So I would say, please connect and talk to other you know, friends and neighbors. And love your neighbor is, can you organize with them? Can you get to know that issue? Mm. Can you change their situation? Not necessarily people of faith not seeing that they have responsibility to change the situation, to be part of that change. Not necessarily, I mean, I would say, yes, it's hard. And for us, it's even Muslim community, some of our East African community, because we came from a war-torn country, we feel like we, are, we made it. We came to America. What, you, what else are you explaining? I mean, I mean are, you, are you complaining? You are not you know, in a war zone. You came to America. You have a shelter. Yes, but our kids don't understand that. I mean, the school we sent to our kids is sending them to prison. And it is not something that we can... I mean, explain that this is how much as a parent I was in one day I was about to die and I came to America and, you know, it, every problem is solved. No, the kids, they have, they wanted to see that a world that has a just, a world has a mercy and a world has a love. And that is where we can, I think we all can, can come together and, and change our situation. And that's, I would say, where I feel like most of us needs to need to know this is the, the time that we, I mean, have an opportunity. Yes, we have a very bad situation in this country right now, the politics and what's going on, but this can be something that we can use mm. in our favor. Mm. I can, thank you. I, um, I, I can't help but play the role of the professor here and maybe just take a moment and summarize some of the things we've heard and then we'll turn to some audience questions. So. Among the many themes I think we've heard, if I had a PowerPoint slide, these would be the bullet points on the PowerPoint, but I will spare you. It is very difficult as a professor to speak without PowerPoint these days, but somehow I will manage. Um, we've heard that there are many, many people, and I'm guessing this applies to those in this very room, who have a high motivation to be engaged in politics and in civic life. But in doing so, we often face a lot of challenges just in your own lives. It's not easy to do this. If you get involved, you can confront all sorts of difficulties. And we've heard that if you get involved, you have to be prepared for the fact that you don't always win. In fact, you're going to lose most of the time. But I think we've also heard that the sustaining force, how does one keep going even though you know you're going to strike out a lot more than you hit a home run, is through the relationships that you build, those other people who can sustain you as you enter the fray. Let's turn to some questions um, from the audience. I'm going to start with one that is actually uh, quite provocative. So um, one of our audience members has asked, and I'm just going to read it verbatim, do you feel that the thriving economy and low unemployment rate under the Trump administration has helped the black community. And maybe I'll broaden that a little bit to help the minority community more, more broadly. <laughs> um, that's a, one of the biggest misconceptions um, th that's out there right now. This, um, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, give it to Donald Trump. He is the best uh, salesman who's ever had the office because he says a lie so much you believe it, and it's not checked by anybody, and so he can say on TV, uh, I'm the best president for black people. You know, I've been better to black people than Obama, than Clinton, than Kennedy. I'm even better than Lincoln, who quote unquote set the slaves free. And so, um, so when people hear that all the time, um, that he has done more for black people People don't look at the numbers. The numbers do not support it. So this thriving economy has missed black America once again. So Philadelphia's numbers have not changed much under Donald Trump. And I don't know, um, you know, I haven't had a raise in three years, so it hadn't impacted me personally. But I'm just, <laughs> so, I'm, my point though is, is that in, in, in all honesty, that 
what, what we have to continue to do is to talk to people about what the truth is. That's one, that's the economy. But secondly, you know, elections ought to be more than just about the economy. It also ought to be about the quality, quality of life and what, you know, what elections stand for. Are we trying to lift people up to our highest, you know, to the highest aspirations that we have? Or are we trying to take people into the gutter? And so, so we cannot simply be driven by what a person does for our pocketbooks. That has often been the excuse that people have used. You know, I'm, I'm always amazed that, um, that we live in these moments where people have allowed their, what has impacted them personally and benefited them personally to allow them to remain silent when masses of people are being persecuted around them. Uh, I, <laughs> so, 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 I'll just, so I'll just say this, that uh, a friend of mine reposted on Facebook this, uh, this, this question or this, this statement that I used in my sermon yesterday, and it said, if you want to know what you would have done during slavery, <clears throat> during the Holocaust, during the Civil Rights Movement, look at what you're doing now, and that's what you would have done. <laughs> and so... And so no matter what happens to the economy, it is no excuse for what has happened to so many groups of people in this country that have been forced into further isolation as a result of this presidency and the uh, reluctance of those in the Congress because of their own personal interest in remaining in office to try to challenge him or to check him. And so um, we still have to fight and resist. Thank you. Uh, Keeping my eye on, on the time, we only have a few minutes left, but I'm going to ask one more uh, fairly provocative question and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, one of our uh, audience members asks, I can't help but notice that the panel is comprised of minority faith leaders. We continue to put the burden of change on the most vulnerable members. What would you say to your white evangelical brothers and sisters in regard to accountability and mobilization for change. <laughs> well, in 15 up. seconds or less, what would you say? Well, <laughs> go first. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm still learning. So. Um, well, show up, guys. Start showing up. I think that uh, something that I've been seeing, I, I think there's great power in the evangelical church. Um, in a community of really faithful people who are driven to organize and to spread the word and be connected to God. Uh, I also see resistance to building allies with other community members uh, that are not connected within the same Christian tradition. And um, I think it's dangerous to think that, that you can do it without us. Um, we can do it without you. We will if we have to, but it's going to be a whole lot better if you're with us. Mm. Wow. wow. I don't know. Other thoughts? I, I, first of all, English is my fourth language, so I would just put a disclaimer before I say, so I would say if, I mean, evangelical, I, I'm not familiar a lot of the denomination in the Christian religion, but what I would say, what I know is as a faith leader, if I am truly a faith person, I would follow, I mean, I would ask if the prophet I follow is Prophet Muhammad, if he come back today, where would he be? So if the Jesus, if, if prophet, I mean, we call it Jesus, if Jesus comes back, where would he be today? Or who would he be organizing with? If, if it's <laughs> organizing, it becomes a thing. So, and I asked my neighbors and my, my Christian friends, I said, this verse in the, in the Bible says, love your neighbor, love thy neighbor. That's, I say, I was, I'm your neighbor, and I don't see that. So I, I mean, I, I definitely, I'm your neighbor, and I don't see that. I see one of you guys attacking us, and the rest is, nobody comes to us. I mean, that's what I started saying. If you really, me, if, you, if your faith means a lot to you, so... Let's come and talk about how your faith, I mean, how, how those who are in, in, in the leaders of your faith, how did they receive their neighbors? Where did they start working? Who they care about? I mean, that's what I would say, and I, was, I would challenge them, especially the faith leaders. Please 
the, what we preach, we have to practice. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Do you want to say something? More? Um, just real quick, if you haven't seen it yet, many of you probably don't read Christianity Today, but the um, magazine... Oh, we that, do now. Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but, so if you have not seen it, read the editorial. Uh, it's very powerful, and um, I think that that is a crack in the armor. And the fact that Billy Graham's you know, magazine has come out so forcefully about the 2020 election in a way that no one would have foreseen... Uh, three years ago, speaks to the ways in which white evangelicals are being, you know, torn internally. And uh, they've received a lot of pushback, but they've also received a lot of support from white evangelicals who are waiting for someone to speak up. So again, I just think that that is a hopeful sign. Mm. Thank you. Um, I apologize that I am unable to get to all of the questions posed by the audience. I'll repeat what um, Hari said in an earlier panel. You can tell how engaged the audience is by the quality of the questions, and these are very high quality. And I would encourage those who have posed questions that weren't answered. I'm sure panelists would be happy to chat afterwards. I certainly would be um, if you want to carry on this conversation. Um, as we bring our panel to a close, I did want to give one final opportunity to each member of our panel to briefly tell us the one thing they would like all of us to take away from this panel, from this event, from the themes that we've discussed. If there's just one thing we want us to remember, what would it be? Uh, I would say go see the movie Just Mercy. Um, yeah. uh, Brian Stevenson grew up as a devout member of the AME Church in the Delaware Annual Conference right next door to where I uh, live now and uh, is unashamed. He actually mentions it a couple of times in the film, and that is evidence of what a real faith relationship, as the imam said, when you take your private pain and make it your public life looks like. So please go see it and then go and do likewise. Uh, I would say that power doesn't start in a vacuum, that it takes a long time to do things like issue 44 and that all Three of us are part of organizing collaboratives that are built with a whole range of allies. So find yourself a group like that. And if you're already in it, then take the next step in leadership to build organizing power within your own communities. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say do the uncomfortable thing, which is or organize and be involved in organizing. And community organizing, I believe, is one of the most effective tools that we can build power and change the lives that those who especially are vulnerable. So get involved and do the things that most of the time is not comfortable, which is talking to your friend and getting to know their pain and also organizing with your community. And that's what I would say. Thank you. Well, folks, as we draw the curtain on this panel and on this event today, let me just close with a thought. Um, just to pick up on a theme of something we discussed earlier, there is a narrative in this country that religion is intrinsically a divisive force. And often that is the way it is portrayed, unfortunately, in um, our popular media. And I think that's just the impression many Americans have. This panel, this discussion, this entire event today and the stories we've heard is a reinforcement that that narrative is not the whole story, that religion can also serve to bring people together. It can also serve to bring about great change. In fact, really, if you think about every major social reform that's ever happened in the history of the United States, religion has been a part of that story. We've been reminded of that today, not just in the abstract, but in flesh and blood, as we've seen living examples in front of us of people who have put themselves on the front lines to bring about that change. So please join me in thanking our panelists and everyone else involved.